Welcome to the Dole Institute of Politics. My name is AJ Mosier, and I'm a member of the Dole Institute's Student Advisory Board, the official student group of the Institute. The student... <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> the Student Advisory Board is a bipartisan group whose members can access many great opportunities through their involvement with the Institute, including volunteering at programs and networking with our special guests. If you are a student and would like to join, please email us at dolesab at ku.edu or speak with a student worker after the program. A video of today's program will be available on our YouTube channel. You can also access videos of past programs by visiting our YouTube channel. A loop hearing system is available to use if you have a T-coil hearing aid. We also have a limited number of listening devices. If you have questions about the loop system or if at any time during the program you have difficulty hearing, please alert one of our staff members. After the program, we will have some time for the audience to ask questions. If you have a question, please raise your hand, and a student worker with a microphone will come to you. Please stand if you are able and ask just one brief question. If you are a part of our virtual audience, you may submit your questions at dolequestions at ku.edu. The Dole Institute's mission is to foster civil and respectful discussion around important and often difficult topics. Please phrase your questions with this in mind. Before we begin, I'd like to remind you to please turn off your cell phones. Now, please join me in welcoming Director Audrey Coleman. Thank you so much, AJ. Now, I see lots of student alumni of, of the Student Advisory Board, in, or former students, uh, alumni of the Student Advisory Board in the audience, and you guys are fantastic, but I gotta tell you, this new class of Student Advisory Board members are really bringing it. Really bringing it. And we had an audience full of lots of new folks a couple weeks ago on October 10th when our Student Advisory Board hosted a, a Taylor Swift, a conversation on influence and advocacy. And so Dole Institute regulars, if you skipped that program, you need to get online and watch it because Ali Hagar, our Student Advisory Board coordinator, did a fantastic job, very substantive, fascinating discussion. So if anybody's skeptical, you need to check, check that out. You, you won't want to have missed it. Um, thank you so much for being here with us this evening, everybody. This program has been highly anticipated as we knew it would be uh, all fall, and tonight we're going to be discussing Celinda Lake and Ed's book, Question of Respect. You can see I've been doing lots of reading required, reading lots of note taking. You'll want to uh, pick up a copy if you, if you uh, don't already have one. Uh, we're welcoming back Jerry Seib, who was our fellow in fall of 2022. It's actually homecoming week at KU, and Jerry is a distinguished alum of this university, so let's hear it for that. <laughs> Welcome back, Jerry and Barb. We're so pleased to have you back in Lawrence. We missed you. <laughs> Okay, before I turn it over to Jerry to introduce uh, Ed and Celinda further, I want to uh, remind you all that we have a wonderful new partnership with the Bipartisan Policy Center, a centrist, uh, a common ground seeking think tank in DC. And on November 9th, coming up at 10 a.m., not a usual time, but you will want to put this on your calendar. We're going to welcome a visiting fellow, Katie Harbath, who is the former public policy director at Facebook. She spent 10 years building and leading teams that managed elections and helped government and political figures use the social network to connect with their constituents. So in addition to being a senior advisor for technology and democracy at the International Republican Institute, she's also a fellow at the BPT BPC. She's gonna be talking about the state of digital democracy in 2024. Uh, there's a number of significant elections that year. We have new technology AI. We have technology that uh, we're still grappling with. It's gonna be a fascinating discussion Please join us at 10 a.m. on Thursday, November 9th. Let's see here. Any other announcements? I don't think so. I am so pleased to turn it back over to, to Jerry Seib. Jerry, uh, thanks so much for tonight's discussion. Welcome thank back. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Audrey. Thank you for, to the Institute. It's nice to be back. Um, thank you all for showing up. Gloomy night. Sorry about that. I think this weather was sunny and warm till we showed up. And <laughs> this, this is what Washington brings you all, you know. I I'll just say, I think the atmosphere was gloomier in the House Republican Conference yeah. today than it is out here because they failed. If you missed it, once again, they failed to pick a speaker. So 
um, maybe we'll help them solve their problems with our conversation tonight. Um, I'm really happy that we're going to talk about this subject at hand, which is how to create respect um, and civility and bridge divides in the American political system. And I'm glad we have these two people, uh, really smart Washington uh, hands who know uh, each other and know this subject really well. Uh, let me introduce them briefly, and then we'll, we'll have a conversation. And at, at, 40 minutes or so in, we'll turn it over to you all for questions. And if you're watching um, on YouTube, you can send in questions online at dolequestions, somebody help me here, dolequestions at ku.edu. Um, Celinda Lake is a native of Montana, born and raised on a ranch. Um, and she is, among many other things, one of the political world's uh, most avid whitewater rafters, I believe. <laughs> Uh, she graduated from Smith College in uh, Massachusetts and held a master's degree in political science and survey research from the University of Michigan and spent some time here at the University of Kansas at a French symposium? French camp. French camp, <laughs> all right. Um, Selinda cr created her own uh, polling firm, Lake Research Partners, which is known for cutting edge a cutting edge research on behalf of dozens and dozens of democratic campaigns and progressive caucuses. She was one of the two main pollsters for the Biden 2020 presidential campaign and continues to serve as a pollster uh, to the Democratic National Committee and to lots of progressive causes and all kinds of Democratic candidates. And Ed was born in San Francisco, um, <laughs> but as the child uh, of an Army family, I think you say a proud Army brat, if I have that correct, <laughs> yeah. Um, attended 15 schools between kindergarten and college, including for a while in Kansas, I believe. Um, and graduated from high school in Germany. He attended Cameron University, not so far from here, down in Lawton, Oklahoma. Um, but there he kind of got the political bug, went to work uh, in politics in Oklahoma. One thing led to another, he went to work for the Republican National Committee, and eventually the Terrence Group is a highly respected Republican polling firm and ultimately became its co-owner, president, and CEO. And he spent 30 years helping elect Republicans of all kinds at all levels um, of the government. But most important for our purposes tonight, these two pollsters have, since 1991, conducted jointly the Battleground Poll. The Battleground Poll is a collaborative, bipartisan survey that offers the perspectives of both parties um, on the same set of numbers. It's uh, conducted not for the benefit of any paying client or any candidate, but to give the public a look at what's happening inside uh, their own country and inside the political system. Uh, it's currently conducted for the Georgetown University Institute of Politics and Public Service. And together, uh, Celinda and Ed have received the Lifetime Achievement Award from the American Association of Political Consultants for their work on that poll. And last but certainly not least, they, um, as a result of that work together, have produced this book, which <laughs> Audrey showed up. It's called A Question of Respect. You are now the very first people, I believe, in the world to see the Spanish, Spanish <laughs> language version of this book. So. Um, and it, it's great. I, like uh, Audrey, have earmarked my copy because there's so many good points made in there, and we'll try to cover some of them tonight. Um, I thought maybe as a backdrop for our conversation, we could um, show a slide. I'm not sure. Oh, there it is. So wow, this yeah. is one of the questions from the most recent Battleground poll, but it actually goes back, as you'll see, some years. And the question is, think ahead to a year from now, and on a scale from zero to 100, where zero is, there's no political division in the country, and 100 is political division on the edge of a civil war, where do you think the level of political division will be a year from now? And as you can see, we're basically three quarters of the way to a civil war. Um, so that's pretty chilling. Um, but you guys are, want to address this topic, and I want to have you address it with us. So let's start with the topic of the book, in which you refer to the need for respect, which I find interesting because, you know, in, in conversations we've had here over the last uh, year or so, we've talked a lot about the need for civility or uh, empathy. You guys talk about respect, which is deeper. So, Linda, why respect? Why is that the goal? Um, because I think that respect, uh, we, we originally were going to call the book Civility, and uh, we have polled on, and this is Ed's insight as well, that civility is the language of respect. But as you say, respect goes deeper. And I think the one thing that um, didn't get mentioned in our bio that was really formative for both of us, uh, I was born and raised a Republican and changed to a Democrat in the same year. 
in the same campaign that Ed, who was born and raised a Democrat, changed to a Republican. <laughs> uh, now, Ed always te teases me that he went to the winning side. <laughs> um, but, uh, and uh, actually, when I went to French camp, my Republican parents thought they were sending me to conservative Kansas, so they weren't worried at all. And then they read about Lawrence in 1967 <laughs> and 68, and I almost didn't get to French camp. Um, so, uh, but I think what um, we, we both firmly believe that for people to get along and come to common solutions, you have to respect each other, you have to listen. Now, you can lose your respect pretty fast, but you have to grant someone respect. And out of the military tradition, out of the ranching tradition, that's really a formative, was a formative value that we both learned from our families. In my case, I remember um, one day uh, at, at the breakfast nook table and uh, my dad said, well, okay, we're gonna have to go work with Mr. Miles and we're gonna have to monitor the fence and repair the fence between our joint properties. And of course, the little smart asked me, I said, I thought we didn't like Mr. Miles. <laughs> and my dad goes, okay, number one, you never say that aloud again. Number two, it doesn't matter whether we like each other. We share a joint fence line. We have to respect each other. We have to repair this fence or both of our cattle will get out. And um, that kind of notion of listening to someone, finding common ground, respecting them, uh, assuming the best in them. And the book is really about the cultural and um, structural features that are promoting division and lack of respect, and that we are, like the American public, extremely concerned yeah. about that. And I want to go through some of those features, but Ed, one of the questions that I always ask myself, because if you've been around you know, a long enough time and we were all kind of contemporaries, you ask, was there respect? Did that ever exist in our lifetimes? In, in your experience, was there kind of mutual respect among political rivals at one time and that we've simply oh, I, lost it? I think absolutely, yeah. absolutely. I mean, people forget that the first negative campaign in a presidential campaign came after Ronald Reagan was out of office. Mm. I mean, there was never negative campaigns. The closest it came was the uh, Goldwater campaign where they kind of implied he was for a war. The Lyndon Johnson would start a nuclear war. Yes. Yeah. Um, but uh, no, I think there was definitely a lot of respect. We're, we're sitting in the house of someone that was an mm -hmm. example of that type of respect. Um, it was certainly something, as Celinda was, I was raised with that. Um, my father, who played a great deal of influence in my life uh, in, in terms of politics, um, when he was 11, he was walking home after serving mass as an altar boy and saw the smoke coming up from Pearl Harbor. And from that day on, all I ever wanted to do was go in the military. Mm -hmm. And that respect for country he had before it was even a state was there. Um, uh, one of the memories I have most of him was in 1959. I was seven years old. We were on our way to Germany for the first time. Um, and uh, the news came that Hawaii had been made a state and he had hidden a flag in the suitcase and took that flag out and we sat as a family in the middle of the Atlantic and sewed a star on. Um, uh, he also had a cigar box in a suitcase. I was seven, you know, is that candy? <laughs> we, uh, no, your mom and I plan on having more kids, which totally went over my head. And a year and a half later, my brother was born in Frankfurt and he showed up with that cigar box and asked for it to see the head nurse uh, which back in those days, Jerry, uh, every head nurse was a female that could beat you and I nine out of 10 times. <laughs> um, and he said, in this box is dirt from America and you will put it under the mattress where my child's being born because wow. I want my child to be born on American soil. Um, it was one of the things that we had to deal with, I think, in terms of the book is that respect for our country, respect for the media, respect for religion, respect for virtually everything is at an all-time low today. That was not the case when we were first getting in politics. There was some angst, but not lack of respect. Yeah. Um, and uh, everyone in this country, everyone in this country, feels like they're at the end of some list. And that causes that much more of headbutting because everyone's looking at someone else saying, I'm at the back of this list because of you, yeah. as opposed to saying, we're all in this thing together. How do we lift ourselves up? Yeah. 
Um, by the way, I misspoke. In that 1964 campaign, it was Lyndon Johnson's campaign that ran a commercial yeah. saying Barry Goldwater would start a nuclear right. war, right. and everybody gasped. And now I think that would be kind of just another campaign ad right now. Well, it and wasn't even an ad. It was just they played it one time. Yeah, one time. Yeah. And exactly. that was my first campaign I did when I was 12 years old was 1964. I volunteered in the Lyndon Johnson campaign mm. because my father was in Vietnam, and I mm. want to understand why. Yeah. Um, well, so, so you've, you've done a good job of sort of sketching the change, but I, w I want to talk a little bit about where this turn south happened. You mm -hmm. know, you guys have been doing polling together for three decades. Somewhere in there, something happened and created the divisiveness and, or maybe some things, plural, happened and created the divisiveness and the bitterness. And I don't, I, I wrote an entire book trying to put my finger on what that was mm -hmm. and I failed to do it. What do you think happened? Where did this go south? Uh, I personally think the two things that had the biggest influence were social media uh, and the rise of social media. I think it's uh, very siloing, very polarizing, and now the amount of disinformation. Uh, and I remember when I did the first tester, uh, when I was doing John Tester's races in Montana, and uh, we, we had the highest per capita bot rate in the country. There were whole villages in Moldova <laughs> devoted to Montana. And uh, people in Montana would laugh because we're used to having more cows than people in yeah. Montana, but not more bots than people. <laughs> um, but I think also um, gerrymandering, small donor fundraising. Yeah. I thought small donor fund. I'm, I think we're both adamantly for campaign finance reform. We have different solutions. But we have, we both think that the current system is, is really failing us. I thought small donor contributions would diminish polarization. I was totally wrong. Yeah. And small donor um, contributions have really increased polarization. Um, so th the gerrymandering and Ed talks, and I'll pass the baton to Ed, a lot about the primary structure, which has also been very polarizing. Yeah. And I would add on to that uh, cable news. Mm. Um, you know, they, um, I tend to disagree with people that think cable news, especially, you know, my concern is as voters have become more cynical, they become more susceptible to demagoguery. Mm. And that is anything past 8 o'clock at night on any of the three networks is nothing but pure demagoguery. Mm. Um, and they're putting them to silos. I disagree a little bit that they have uh, political um, uh, opinions as much mm -hmm. as they are trying to drive eyeballs to mm -hmm. a silo and keep them in a silo. So they each picked a certain area that they're going to play to. Um, but I don't think it's driven necessarily by their political leanings as much as by their money leanings yeah. mm -hmm. on what they're doing. Well, I want to I want to tick off each of those issues yep. in a second. But before we do that, let me let me ask you um, at a more 10,000 foot level to oh, try to take apart a little bit of finding from your latest poll in addition to that one. And one of the things we've also seen in our Wall Street Journal polling is that voters regularly say that they want their leaders mm -hmm. to come together and compromise, but they also say in almost equal numbers that they're tired of politicians who compromise on their principles. <laughs> and in your latest poll, this is from your report on your latest poll, you said voters continue to send mixed messages to lawmakers about the importance of compromise. While 83% of respondents agree that compromise and common ground should be the goal for political leaders, an equal number, 82%, agree that they, want, that they are tired of leaders compromising their values and ideals and want leaders who will stand up to the other side. I mean, what are you we know, supposed Jerry, to conclude about that? You know, Jerry, what we say to our that? candidates is voters have mutually contradictory views and usually deeply resent having it pointed out to them. <laughs> <laughs> so you which, may be at the wrong forum, human, right? but, <laughs> but I'll add. add but it's very it. interesting. We, we did what we call a first for, forced choice where we took both of those and put them up against each other. Yeah. And you're right. When you ask it independently, you get 71% saying they want to fight over the values. 75% of that same group says, um, I want compromise. Uh, when you put it against each other, it comes out to about 65 to 68% compromise and only 30% saying they want to fight. The problem is, is that, and this is an outcome from campaign finance reform, where they took money away from the parties. Um, you created super PACs as a result of that. They, they, I've always felt on fundraising, it's like a giant balloon. You squeeze it at one end, it just gets bigger at the other end. And um, the parties, about 
about 20 years ago, began moving to their primaries being about motivating the base rather than going after the battle over getting 50% plus one of all the voters, even during the primary you're playing to. The result is, is that in 1990, you had about 35% of Republicans voting in Republican primaries and 35% of Democrats voting in Democrat primaries. The numbers from 2022 was 15% of Democrats voted in Democrat 15, primaries. 15, 5 one five, and 17% of Republicans voted in the Republican primaries. Well, guess what? It's that 30% that wants you to fight. Mm -hmm. And so the members that are getting elected are the ones that say, I'm gonna go and fight, not the ones that I'm gonna go compromise. And so as much as we talk about other things in the general election, it is really the primary turnout that is causing this polarization. So, uh, the other so, uh, thing well, I think the yeah. most dangerous number in that poll, the one that worries me the most, was that you had a solid majority of both sides. So they say they want compromise, and then they say I've our side has already compromised too much. Uh, and that's what is really scary, I think, is that there isn't a there isn't a common analysis of the problem, like, we got to get together. It's like, no, I already compromised too much. I'm not compromising anymore. And, and that's frightening. And I say that as a liberal. I'm not a moderate. I'm a liberal. And yet, I think that's very dangerous. Yeah. So let's talk about, step by step, some of the problems and potential solutions. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, let's start with, uh, we want, I want to talk about primary participation. But let's, mm -hmm. before we get there, let's talk about gerrymandering. I mean, the process of, drawing up congressional districts that are designed to be safe for one party or the other so that the people who run in that district don't have to talk to anybody on the other side and who are rewarded by making sure the most partisan elements of their base are happy with them. Um, I think that's a big problem. I think that's a core problem. You two may or may not be entire, entirely in agreement about that, but how big a problem is gerrymandering and what can you do about it? I think we have separ slightly separate analyses. I think it's a huge problem. And I think the way, so we've actually done a lot of research on this. The voters are wildly in favor of not having gerrymandering. And they're trying to figure out, well, how do you do a computer model? You can mess around with computers. And the, the solution I love the best actually came from voters in Iowa. And they said, why don't the voters in Kansas draw our lines, and why don't we draw their lines, and then <laughs> somebody will gerrymander? So I thought it was very creative. Um, so I'm, you need to have a neutral process, yeah. and uh, it needs to be an impartial commission. But, but here's the problem. You have to have the people who have benefited from the process as it is agree to change the process. Well, and that's a problem, right? I mean, we've worked for ger uh, anti-gerrymandering. Yeah in all kinds of states. We worked at uh, anti-gerrymandering in California. We were opposed, our firm was opposed by the Democratic Party and the Republican Party. Mm -hmm. Let's be clear, both parties agree on this. Yeah. I'll protect, we'll protect our seats, you protect your seats. And meanwhile, the system rots out of the middle yeah. and people aren't represented and huge numbers of voters have no say because yeah. nobody ever has to listen to them. Right. Uh, so I, I think it's, I think gerrymandering is really dangerous. So Ed, I don't know how much you're in agreement with that, but it does go hand in hand with your comment about par primary elections that pick the most extreme candidates. Well, it does, but that has nothing to do with, with gerrymandering. That has to do with the low turnout in the primary process. Um, and I have a little bit different view because I was very involved in the redistricting in, in 1990 and 2000 when actually the Republicans teamed up with the African-American community because what the Democrats were doing is they were taking the African-American community and splitting it up and putting it as many districts as they could to raise the Democratic vote and they would buffer their vote a little bit. Um, we cut a deal with, with the uh, African-American community at, the, at that point that what we did is we kept together those black communities in more of a concentration. Maybe you had to do some strange lines to get there. But we went from in 1980 having 3% of Congress being African-American to after the, uh, the 2000 election, we have 14% of the members of Congress are African-American. And so I think we upped the African-American vote that from a national standpoint, they're better represented as opposed to just being represented by the party. And what was interesting is that the Democrats complained about 
doing it one way, and it had to be one way, and then accused us of doing it the wrong way on the other way. Um, and it wasn't. We were, we were actually trying to keep communities more together. That was to our benefit. Yeah. Uh, so let's go to, the, to your other the problem you cited about primaries, um, which is to say if you have 15% on one side and 17% on the other side, you have the most partisan people in the country picking the people who will be their representatives in Congress. How do you fix that? How do you convince people in the middle uh, that they ought to show up for primaries? Is it to have more open primaries? Is it to change the way party registration is done generally? What, what's the way to fix that problem? Uh, I don't know that I have the answer for that, except I know that what we have to do is increase turnout in the primary. We have to get more of America participating in picking the actual nominees that we then pick from. Um, because if it's already baked into the cake in the primaries, the general elections almost don't matter yeah. um, because you have the polarization that's there. Um, I think you're also seeing a little bit of pushback uh, in the Republican, what's going on in the speaker's fight today. It is a fight between those that have been kind of quiet about not being one of the fighters, yeah. one of the compromisers, and they keep going back and forth. Mm -hmm. They finally got one this morning picked, and then Trump steps in and says, no, we don't, we want to get rid of them. Yeah. Um, the first thing we need to do is get Trump to shut up. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And um, believe me, that's a hard thing to do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, he, it was very interesting that he had a horrible day today in the courts in New York, a yeah. horrible day in what was coming out of Georgia. And yet he was going to speak out on what was happening in the House. Yeah. Well, yeah. I was going to wait on Trump a little you bit. You know, uh, <laughs> but let's, <laughs> let's just go One there. I, back for a while. I, I think some other structural reforms that would be good. I think that, um, you know, a lot of young people want more third parties. Yeah. Um, and I think that's an interesting. Um, I actually think I, I, we both agree that uh, the diminishing of the two-party system yeah. uh, was a really bad thing because the two-party systems did absorb a lot of people and, and got compromised. Um, I personally am very strongly in favor of ranked choice voting, uh, which is where people get to vote and they get to rank their choices. It makes campaigns less negative. Uh, it uh, increases the number of women and people of color who are represented. Um, it ha I mean, we did Mary Patola's race, the uh, Alaska native who was elected out of Alaska. If you haven't seen her, please get online and look at her. She's amazing. Um, but she would not, this, it's very clear she would not. She beat Sarah Palin. She would not have been elected had it not been for ranked choice voting. And I think Ed always says something that I think is very powerful. When you look at reforms, one of the things they need to do is increase participation. It needs to be a criteria, and I had not thought of that, but I really agree with him, that we apply to all reforms. It has to increase participation. Mm -hmm. uh, and I think, if I can join it, there's one thing I kind of sense is that we ought to put, you know, take September and do, divide the country into four quarters and do primaries once a week in September then go to October and do the general election. But when you have states that are doing primaries mm -hmm. in March and April and May, and then they go quiet, um, it, it's just, it's- So you're talking about big regional primaries. Big regional primaries, where, where you get the information out there when the primary is gonna go, and yeah. you make it a national primary month, yeah. as opposed to being spread be over seven or eight months. Yeah. It'll be yeah. interesting. Um, by the way, uh, you mentioned ranked choice voting. What about jungle primaries where people are voting regardless of, uh, of yeah, party? Yeah, open primaries or jungle primaries are interesting. You know, I, I feel really torn about that because on the one hand, I think strong parties yeah. help increase participation and help bring people together. Uh, obviously, jungle primaries diminish the power. Jungle primaries are where everybody gets to run against each other, and so it diminishes the power of the parties. Yeah. So that's that. I think that's a dilemma. What's interesting, Jerry, about this book too, and I think it showed uh, a way forward, is when we wrote the book, we realized we didn't necessarily agree on solutions, but we agreed on the problem. So we wrote the book with the problem in the we voice and the solutions in the I voice, giving people lots of different choices. I think that's a model. You know, why is it, why can't we make any progress on anything? Yeah. Why can't, is foster care a partisan issue? I don't know. Is disability rights 
a partisan issue, really? I mean, we can't make any progress on it without getting partisan. I'm having a hard time believing that as a liberal Democrat. Yeah. Um, let's talk a little bit about the uh, craft of running campaigns and how that mm. might contribute to the problem. And let, you know, I'm thinking about negative ads here. Mm. Um, you know, we, Barb and I live in the Washington area, as you guys do, and right now every, everybody is running for the Virginia State House and Senate, so we're hearing lots of campaigns. I have yet to hear a positive campaign ad. In right. America. Every campaign ad is negative. Um, and another pollster, somebody you both know, said to me a couple of years ago something that keeps ringing in my head. You know, when you have, you, when you spend billions and billions of dollars over a period of 20 or 30 years on ads that tell people the system is broke and they're all corrupt, it turns out that has an effect. <laughs> and yeah. that's kind of what campaign <laughs> ads do now. Is there a way to change that? Ed, why don't you start? Well, you, you, you need, I mean, I like to think I ran, you know, my career was a career of running positive campaigns. Um, uh, I always hated uh, the media people that would come in and they'd be all flowery about we're gonna get this and we're gonna do this and do that. One of the th things I developed is if I went into a campaign to talk about doing the campaign, and if the first thing they had done was opposition research, I walked away from the campaign mm -hmm. because they were already in the wrong mindset. Opposition, opposition research meaning find out something negative about, about my opponent. opponent. Yeah. Right. And uh, you know what I used to do with my candidates is I'd say, okay, if you want to run, I want you to take two months and I want you to drive around the district and I want to take you go to every town take notes, what's Main Street like, what's people like, go to um, uh, some of the restaurants and don't get into conversations, listen to the conversations, listen to what people are talking about yeah. when they're there, getting them to understand who are the voters they're trying to appeal to. Yeah. But we've kind of lost this, the idea of running a campaign is to win the support of a majority of the people. It's now down to polarize your people, get them activated, and do a better job of turning them out than the other side. Yeah. But, you know, there are, I have to get you to some of the states where we've run. Um, uh, James Lankford in Oklahoma yeah. ran a positive campaign the entire time. But that was a good example. We were running against a guy named Shannon, T.W. Shannon, who was an African-American Republican Speaker of the House, State House, who was seen as the new Tea Party candidate that was actually mm -hmm. African American. And they got lots of national support. His PAC came in and attacked us. When that didn't do any good in moving the numbers, he then started attacking us. And when that happened, we got uh, the outgoing senator to say something about negative campaigns and how he was against it. But then our super PAC, two days after the senator went up with a spot saying that, went up with an attack against our opponent. And we probably broke a few laws in how direct we were, but we said, you will take that spot off the air mm. because we don't want it on. Mm. And he will talk about issues in contrast, but he won't do anything personal. He won't do anything ugly. And um, what I basically say to the media people, when they, the first thing they always say, well, we do negative because it works. Yeah. My response was, so does positive. Try it once in a while. Yeah. Yeah, well, as you pointed out, Senator Hickenlooper in Colorado mm -hmm. made mm -hmm. this a selling point for him. So I don't yeah. do negative, and he won. So, mm -hmm. but you know, you know one of the, to something I want to you, you, underscore something Ed said earlier, which is uh, the reason you're seeing negative ads in the DC market right now. Those ads are not funded by the candidates. Exactly, for the most I was part. just going to ask you about that. They're yeah. funded by Yonkin Money, Yonkin Money, and the governor, and they're funded by the Democratic yeah. Party. And I think this right now, a candidate, if they're lucky they control 25% of their message. That's appalling. If you're putting yourself out there, you ought to be in charge of what's said about you. And the problem is with the independent expenditures is there's nobody, there's no Barb who says, Jerry, that's not you. Uh, or, you know, uh, Ed, your kids are gonna see that. Mm -hmm. That's not what we wanna put up there. That's not how you have spent your whole time. Yeah. And there's, there are no controls, and they put up anything, they put up things that are at the margin, they put up very divisive ads, they're very short-term in their thinking because they're not planning to come back to the community. They're moving on to the next race. So I, I think both of us are really convinced 
that uh, while we have different solutions to it, this third party expenditure is making these campaigns very negative mm -hmm. and it's rotting out our system. And it's take a lot of people won't run. Yeah. If you're not gonna have any control over what you're saying, why would you run? Yeah. So what's the solution to that? That's gotta be campaign finance reform. Campaign finance reform. Which takes what form? Well, we have different solutions to that. So Did I'll share mine and he can share okay, his. Good. Uh, I'm for, well, we need Citizens United redecided. Uh, I mean, voters, this is so-called free speech. Well, voters say it's paid speech, and I agree with voters. It's bought speech, it's not free speech. Um, secondly, if we had public financing, then we could limit um, the kinds of contributions and spending. Uh, so, and, and I, I was very disappointed, and I understand, but it's a race to the bottom, when President Obama decided not to take the public mm -hmm. financing in the presidential. Yeah. Uh, that just, blew open the gates on the presidential. So I'm for public financing and I'm for um, redesigning Citizens United. Let me raise... But Ed has a difference. Well, before we go to Ed, let me pick up on something you said before about small dollar donations. A lot of the campaign finance reform proposals that Democrats put forward say, let's emphasize small dollar donations by having a government match small donations. Yeah. Um, you know, six times, say, for example. Yeah. Like, I looked up today, and you know, you, as you know, you noted before that small dollar donations don't necessarily make uh, people more civilized. Not at all. It, uh, Marjorie Taylor Greene, um, in the in so far in this cycle, has raised 1.9 million dollars in online donations of $200 or less. Yeah. Alexandria Ocasio Cortez has raised $2.7 million. Right. It's 74 percent of Marjorie Taylor Greene's money comes from small dollar donations and 77% of AOCs do. These are not people who live in their districts no. or who care what they are doing for their constituents. This is online fundraising from partisans from around the country who are picking them because they're the most uh, politically charged figures in their party in the House right now. That's not gonna produce less partisanship or less rancor. No, I think what you have to do, I mean, again, I said, uh, I had originally been totally for small donor contribution yeah. and the matching. Uh, I was wrong. Uh, uh, and it, what it has done is it has really promoted ideological money. It's promoted polarization. Um, and, and AOC's our client, so I would I say she's very different from Marjorie Taylor Greene. But <laughs> we'll put that we aside. We probably all agree on that. <laughs> um, uh, that I've been uh, offering to give her to you and for a draft. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, our side, you know, Marjorie Taylor Greene said, uh, why don't we uh, leave? And, and our side put out a meme, uh, just leave us New Orleans and then go. <laughs> you know, you're right, go, but leave us New Orleans. Because um, we really like New Orleans. Um, the, I think uh, what I'm intrigued by is the idea that you see in Seattle and some other places of vouchers, yeah. where every voter is given a voucher and they can spend that on whatever candidate they want. And, uh, but, you know, the overlying, whatever you think about campaign finance, you have to get increased participation. And right now we've got people so cynical, nobody in their right mind would give money to campaigns. Yeah. Why would you spend your money that way when yeah. you could give it to charities yeah. and, and churches and your own kids? Uh, it, it's an act of insanity to support a campaign. Um, and it leads to the most polarized yeah. politics. So Ed, how would you fix campaign finance? Well again, I truly believe, and we've seen this time and time again when we do campaign finance reform, I think talking about doing it federally um, uh, is interesting, but we have trouble paying for a lot of things in this country, much less adding <laughs> that burden of, of what is out there. I truly believe that the campaign money is this giant balloon that if you squeeze on one end, it gets bigger at the other end. So why not do the obvious? Why not make it instant reporting, unlimited contributions to the candidate, and then let them control their message in the campaigns. It won't change a lot how much money is going into campaigns. It will, it will just mean that they have more control of 50% of their message rather than only 25% of their message. And you can put more responsibility on them for when they do a negative cam campaign. I mean, we used to be able to run campaigns and say, why are they running a negative yeah. campaign? Is because they're trying to do X, Y, and Z, or they're trying to hide X, Y, and Z. And those used to always work, but it doesn't work under a PAC situation. Yeah. Because these guys, and 
quite frankly, it's, it's, been, um, it's been rougher on the Republican side. Now, mo more PAC money went to Biden than went to Trump in the last campaign. Mm -hmm. More PAC money went to, re to Democrat senators than Republicans in the last campaign. So it's not a matter of one side or the other getting more of the money. It's how that money is spent. Yeah. And I think if we want to do it, put the responsibility back on the candidates. That if you're going to run a negative campaign, then you're subject for being attacked on it. And if you promote a positive campaign, that's an image people want to see. They want to see more positive. Yeah. Um, let's talk about the, the media a little bit. I mean, social media and then my media, the news media. Um, but first, social media. Would, you, would each of you agree that there should be some government regulation of social media? Totally. Ed? Yes, I just don't see where it is. Yeah. I don't see where you get there. Um, and uh, I just finished a two-year project with Meta mm -hmm. um, that brought a bunch of us in. They had Harvard professors and professors from all over the country and talking about, they wanted to look at how do you get more civility in what is there. Um, uh, it's interesting, uh, Celinda and I wrote a book I mean, we ran a class at Georgetown <coughs> in the spring on our book. And we asked that as a final thing, will you give us some ideas of what you would do? And one of the most interesting things that came out was this group, they worked in teams, came out with, we need to get a social media program for just college students. Mm -hmm. That we will manage through our opinion, bad, uncivil comments and good comments. and. Um, I'm not explaining exactly as well yeah. as, as they did, but it was very interesting. They came up with kind of a self-policing, mm -hmm. but their feeling was you had to keep out of it adults who were going to yeah. come in and poison their social media. Yeah, so they wanted their own social media yeah. that they would police themselves. That they would yeah. police and they would keep positive on both ends. Yeah, well, I, I think we, I've, in our experience here at, at Harvard, I think we found a lot of, uh, students here can speak up, but a lot of student disillusionment with social media. I think it's mm -hmm. not lost on them. But and what would what would your answer be on social media? Oh, I'm 100% for regulating it. And I'm for getting uh, disinformation out of it. I um, hate speech. Uh, uh, you know, the interesting thing is the public's very supportive of regulation. And um, coming at it from a little bit different perspective, mm -hmm. the Republicans are just as supportive as the Democrats, but with slightly different perspective. I grant you that it's difficult and I grant you that uh, freedom of speech is a very very important thing to hold on to but I don't think disinformation and misinformation is freedom of speech and I guess Good. I'm also influenced by the fact that women candidates get ten times women Democratic women candidates get ten times the number of mis, uh, misinformation negative misogynist violent uh, comments that Democratic men get. Mm. Republican women get twice as much. Mm. This is not a neutral phenomenon that's happening. It's misogynist, it's racist, it's dangerous. Mm. And I think we need to get it regulated. Um, it was very interesting during the, uh, when the speaker, someone broke in their house and yeah, that was assaulted her husband. I think the media missed something in terms of social media. Um, I happen to know with Joni Ernst, my wife is her chief of staff. Presently, there are three people in jail today because they went on social media and made death threats mm -hmm. to the point that they could prosecute them and put them in jail. And I think if you really checked out there, probably every member of Congress and every senator has two or three people that are there for the very same reason. So if you're that much of an idiot that you think you can go on and make death threats and not be held accountable, yeah. how are you going to put regulations on that are going to change some of it? Yeah, that's fair. Um, let me ask you about two other areas, and then we'll turn to the audience for questions. But in, in your book, you guys are pretty tough on my business, the, the mainstream media, I guess, uh, for lack of a better less term. Less newspapers, though, than cable news okay, and social good, media. Glad. That's a good starting point. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> um, but I, I also agree, I mean, well, I don't want to, I'll say my piece later, but what's the, what's the r role of uh, what people think of as regular media, not social media, in this division polarization process? What, and, and what 
should we be doing about it? What sort of policing should be done on our side of that fence? Well, I don't know. The, the only example, and I know he was cable news, but I was astounded how the media took the story about Tucker Carlson and made it a story about Murdoch. Because here you had a case where someone knowingly took misinformation and put it out there, which meant you had a journalist putting out disinformation. And he should have been run out of the business yeah. for doing that. And I think the, you know, I think we talk about regulations on social media. I think journalists need to start standing up against those journalists who are part of putting misinformation out there and turning it into disinformation. Yeah. Yeah, I think the two things I would say, and uh, actually, Jared, I'd really love to hear your answer because you're far more informed, and I think you represent the class of reporters who don't engage in this. But I think that um, one. Um, a lot of people, particularly on cable news, the reporters who get on cable news, they get rewarded for the number of yeah. hits they get. They don't get rewarded for winning a Pulitzer Prize or, or telling the truth. They get rewarded for social media hits. So these mediums are in incredibly intertwined in a way that's very destructive. Secondly, I'm flabbergasted that, uh, and you could tell me I'm wrong, and I would respect you for that, but I'm flabbergasted that reporters, and not people like you, will cite social media mm -hmm as a source, really? Yeah. With the kind of misinformation that's going on out there? And then actually your wife, Barb, mentioned something in the car that I really thought was interesting and I'm loving, which is integrating data more yeah. with uh, reporting so that, uh, you said it better, Barb, than I w will say it now, but the idea that it's not just opinions on both sides, but there may be some data to mm -hmm. look at for this question. I think that's an incredibly, and in the era of big data, I think that's an incredibly yeah. intriguing. Although, one of the things as you look at newspapers is one of the first things that have gone away is research departments. Right. Yeah, you true. know, you, you, they're, they're cutting their budgets because they're not being looked at as much. They're struggling to survive out there. Mm -hmm. And the first thing they're cutting is the very research yeah. Yeah. programs yeah. that that kept That's them more true. honest. That's true. Well, Barb's doing a lecture at the journalism school tomorrow on using data and reporting, so journalism students pay attention. Um, all students pay attention. Uh, yeah, all students. Uh, no, but I, look, I think that, uh, I think there has been, I think there have been some troubling trends, e even in the newspaper business. Mm -hmm. I think that, you know, reporters have let their voice slip into their coverage too much, mm -hmm. uh, and particularly younger reporters think they need to create a brand, which mm -hmm. is not, when yeah. I started in journalism, nobody thought we had a brand or needed one or should aspire to have one, and now people talk about that. And I agree with you that, you know, and this is very tempting, because, you know, I've done a lot of cable TV stuff over the years, and it's very tempting to go on cable TV and drop your journalistic standards that you have on the print side, because you know what they want you to do on mm -hmm. television, and that's a way to get invited back. And so. Those are, I think those are things, Ed, to your point, I think people in my business need to think hard about and police themselves. Mm -hmm. And I think that happens, and I think it probably happens more in print than, than right. online. Much but, more. Um, so before we turn to the audience, we do have to talk about the elephant in the room who's named Donald J. Trump. Um, <laughs> and I thought I would just, there, there, there's a story in the, uh, in the Wall Street Journal on the, our website today um, that has, it's about Trump's style and how it might create legal problems for him, but it's not just legal problems, so I'll, le I'll read you the lead of our story. Mm. Donald Trump has attacked judges and prosecutors as, quote, thugs and psychopaths, called for shoplifters to be shot, suggested now retired General Mark Milley could be executed for treason, and joked about last year's violent assault of uh, Congresswoman Nancy Pelosi's husband. That's yeah. just a sample. And you guys raised the question in the book, which is really where I want to take this, which is, is Donald Trump, um, did he start this, or is he a symptom of a disease that was already running through the body politic before he came down that escalator at Trump Tower? Ed, what do you think? Um, I think he's a jerk. <laughs> okay. Well. Um, uh, <laughs> He's more dangerous than a jerk. Uh, uh, yes. <laughs> I, I was going to use a different word, but I couldn't. So, <laughs> um, uh, you know, I, I tell people that I know that my sense of him is he's extremely narcissistic and he's extremely insecure. And he's like nitroglycerin. You take him and sh shake him up, you never know when he's going to explode. Um, I think uh, the thing I resent the most, and this is where the New York case is very interesting, is he's not a businessman, he's a salesman. 
A typical businessman worries about two things. They worry about their employees, and they worry about their product and make sure they match up. His, he's a salesman, and his product is him. And as I've told other candidates, don't get in a food fight with him because the guy has no shame. He will pick the food off his face and throw it right back without thinking twice. Um, uh, I think he is a symptom, but I think, you know, I, I look at things that I just shake my head um, of evangelicals, and I consider myself to be out of that camp, that w would listen to the way he talked and let him get away with it and support him. Um, uh, I had my two sons um, at the time he was first running in 2015, 2016, were eight and 12. And I could not afford to go on TV and say anything positive about him and have my sons think in any way I was supporting the type of person he was. Um, and so I didn't. And I went on Morning with Maria in May of 16. Uh, we actually went to New York um, and did Morning Joe, the two of us, with a survey that was very interesting and got a call and they wouldn't let Salon to go on. And they had me go on. So I went in and obviously they had tried to move it away from what happened on Morning Joe. And at the end she asked, what do you think of Donald Trump? He's wrapped up the nomination, looks like he's wrapped up the nomination. And it was like one of those, if I'd been on the phone, I would have acted like we got disconnected. <laughs> no. do, I, do I say what I really think or do I sugarcoat it? And I said, it kind of came out, um, uh, I said, from my perspective, he has a limited philosophical compass and a questionable moral compass. Um, now, I was sugarcoating it and found out <laughs> over the years that I truly was sugarcoating it. Um, but uh, I remember Kellyanne Conway called me about three years into the administration, said, you actually said something positive about Trump when you get on the Trump train. <laughs> and I said, Kellyanne, um, you know the story. When I can put my arm around my two sons and point to Donald Trump and say, that's the kind of man I want you to be, I'll join the Trump train. But you know well as I do, as well as your husband and daughter know, that's never going to happen. Mm -hmm. And she kind of laughed and hung up the phone. <laughs> <laughs> but see, Celinda, here's what, here's what I wonder about. You know, Donald Trump's not different now than he was in 2000 or 2008 when he thought about running for president. But by the time 2016 rolled around, he was the flavor of the month. So that tells me it's not just Donald Trump because otherwise he would have been plucked out of uh, New York business to be president before 2016. Oh, I think we both strongly agree with you on that, Jerry. I definitely believe he's a symptom, not the uh, yeah. cause. Now he has really accentuated yeah. things. And for me, what's sobering is that he really does hold on to 38, 43% of the public. And I'm very concerned that you have two thirds of the Republicans who think that he legitimately was elected president. I just think he's an incredibly dangerous authoritarian figure. And it just doesn't seem to matter what he does, he holds on to this vote. And mm -hmm. the idea that you could you know, you bring makeup and hair to your mugshot. Uh, when that happened, the Democrats were like, why is he bringing makeup and hair to his mugshot? And then he raises $7 million yeah. that night. Yeah. I just, I, you know, he's an incredible symptom, but it's, uh, a, the disease is acute. Yeah. But I, I, I think that's moved with Republicans. What, mm. what we saw in, after the 2020 election is that there were, 60% of Republicans were what I call always Trumpers. They believed everything he said. They marched in lockstep behind him. Um, there were 30% they had moved to, uh, the best way to call them is always Republicans. They were saying at that point that he, they liked what he accomplished, but they were beginning to, to say, yes, he uh, doesn't say things the right way. He doesn't act the right way. By 2022, there had been a 20-point shift from the 60% down to 40% saying they would believe everything he said, and an increase on the group of voters that became a majority at 50% saying, I like what he did, but I don't like the yeah. way he acted. 
And I think that's where a lot of the media is getting it wrong on what's happened with DeSantis. Is DeSantis um, went out there, I think, with a fairly good strategy in the beginning, which is I'm going to stand for all the things he does, but I'm not going to be a jerk. I'm not going to be an asshole uh, in the way I do it. And then he got involved in all that stuff down in Florida. And all of a sudden, those voters that had moved to him moved away from him because they saw, we were seeing in the focus groups, they were calling him a mini-me. And they were like, well, if he's just a mini-me, I'm gonna go with the real thing. But they are still sitting there looking for someone else. Mm -hmm. yeah. And I think you're gonna see DeSantis crumble in Iowa, mm -hmm. even more so in New Hampshire. And I think once he gets out of the race, then those people that are went back to Trump are going to start looking at one of the other candidates. And that's where you may see a, a fire lit behind one of the other candidates. And you're, and you're thinking Nikki Haley is that person. I think Nikki Haley is that. Well, it's, you know, it, it is true, and I want to ask you all to, for questions here, but um, it is we're seeing some of that in our polling, that mm -hmm. there is this a kind of a, well, I like what Trump did, but I don't anymore like the way right. he does it. Right. That's emerging more clearly, I think, than a couple of years ago. Oh, so definitely. Maybe, maybe that's where we're headed. Um, so um, I want you all to um, to take part here. Raise your hand. I think we have some microphones. Uh, just one second. Yeah. And uh, so stand up. And Bob, I'll start with you. Uh, ask a question. Uh, question actually has a question mark at the end of it. Um, <laughs> and so remember that. And and um, go ahead. Uh, my wife's in panic while I'm standing here asking a question. <laughs> but a couple of points. Jerry, last year you had a pollster sitting in that in that chair. He was two-time pollster of the year, he made the comment, there's negative campaigning because it works. Mm -hmm. I just wanted to add that too. And by the way, this has been tremendous dialogue and conversation, but that scares me the most, the fact that the process of having a negative campaign does work. I don't know how that's gonna change. And I think you, you alluded to some conversation about the negative campaigning, mm -hmm. and my biggest concern is, is it ever going to change? The second point I wanted to make is we talk about the participation in voting. I have two boys, one has his own business, and they are all over the political scene. The problem is they have no reason to vote because the mm -hmm. candidates and the campaigns give them nothing to think about other than negative campaigning. My sons are concerned about one drives 200 miles a day, the cost of fuel, the mm -hmm. amount of taxes that he pays because he has his own business. I'm concerned about where are we going with Social Security, Medicare, Medicaid? Mm -hmm. You mentioned the foster program. Nobody's willing to stand up and say, here are my solutions for these kinds of problems. And so you're voting in a fog. You don't really know what candidates are for. So, so those are my comments. So we get and, back. And, and my answer is exactly what I said earlier. We have to get people participating more and picking the nominees. Because by the time you have that 30% on both ends, nominating people in the general election all you're going to hear is the fight you're not going to hear what is it for and one of the things i always started with every candidate is you need to talk about what you're for not what you're against and that's how we get campaigns to change where that becomes the gold in a campaign is talking about what you're for not talking about what you're against i guarantee you too if the candidates were 100 percent in charge of the finances, you would see more positive campaigns. You'd still see negative because they get scared because their teams will recommend it, but you'd see more positive because, and we've all been in rooms where the candidate said, uh, I'm in a race right now where uh, the candidate said, I want to change my media, and she's behind, and she said, I want to change my media. I want to tell the voters what I'm for. Uh, I've run this contrast, and I want to tell the voters what I'm for. Uh, I think rank, there's no question ranked choice voting makes for more positive campaigns because if I want all of your voters to put me second, I can't go after you tooth and tongue. Uh, I have to say what I'm for. I might even run an ad that says you and I share X, Y, and Z. Hmm. So I think that um, I think there are some things we can do. I think the other thing is right now the thinking is really, really short term. 
and uh, it's to get that particular candidate elected. And w that short-term thinking is permeating our system. We've both been in meetings that I think we're both horrified by, where our party leadership will say, we don't want anything to get done because we don't want the Republicans to get credit, we don't want the Democrats to get credit. Mm -hmm. Meanwhile, Rome burns. Uh, and that's just, in my mind, that's just appalling. Uh, and so I really think that long term, short term, yes, it works. So does dynamite. Uh, so does nitroglycerin. <laughs> we, uh, as you were saying, um, but not if you want to build something for the future. Um, Bob Dole wanted to build something for the future. I didn't always agree with him, but it was clear that he wanted to build a stronger America for everyone. And um, we need to get back to that. One, so, uh, one of the things I'm most proud of with, with our company is we decided 30 years ago that we had worked for the committees. We didn't want to work with everyone just because they got the nomination. And so we entered into every interview with a candidate and made it very clear this is a two-way interview. You're interviewing us to see if we have something to give you. And we're interviewing you to see if we spend time away from our family, which if we do our job well, we will. Are you worth it? And that's why we ended up working with so many good people, like a Frank Keating, mm -hmm. or I could name a dozen that we worked with over the years. That was basically because of that two-way interview, that we got it down to people we believed in, not just for business, but for actually getting them elected. Uh, just a reminder, if you're watching online, you can submit questions online at dolequestions at ku.edu. Um, why don't we go back there to Will, and then we'll come up here next. Uh, thank you. I'm going to break the rules just a little bit, ask one question sort of in two parts. I do think they're deeply related. It's interesting hearing you both talk about your different sort of, you know, feelings on strong parties and party reform and things like that. So I just wanted to get your thoughts on the party spending limits from mm -hmm. bipartisan campaign finance reform, what you think about that, and the kind of a unique American tradition of making, you know, even state you know, run primaries that are mandated by the party. Kansas is an example. The Republican and Democratic parties, you know, the structure themselves, they don't have much control over who can enter that race, who can be nominated, things like that. So I just wanted to he hear your opinions on those. That's a really good set of questions. I'm, I'm honestly not sure what I think. Um, because I can, I, I see incentives and disincentives. Um, in some of the, in one chapter of the book, Ed lays out this formula of, of problem solving, where you solve the problem and then you solve, and then you create more problems, and you have to go solve those problems. And uh, these reforms have a lot of those ideas, uh, a lot of those problems attached to them. Um, it depends a little bit on what the party's spending the money on. If the party's spending the money on negative advertising. In, in their independent expenditure committees, then no, I'm not for it. I'm for limiting that money. If the party's spending the money on registering and get out the vote, I think that's great on training candidates. Uh, the Republicans used, I don't know if you guys still have it or not, but y they used to have a program uh, where they would really support building infrastructure, offer health care to campaign operatives. On the Democratic side, it's well, like, I, you know, we, we would end the pay, the health care, and everything day before the election and say, I hope you make it. Uh, <laughs> so, and here's the address back to your parents. Um, <laughs> so I, I, I think there, it depends on what you're spending the money on. The reforms, as I mentioned to Chair, I feel really, I'm really confused about it because I, I, I like primaries. We run a lot of primaries. I don't think that the party should decide who's running. I think the voters of that party should decide who's running. Um, I've really disliked it when Democrats have gotten involved, uh, often driven by a funder, to pick a candidate in the <coughs> primary. I think that's terrible. Uh, and I think it's, it's on the Democrat side, we've done it so poorly, it's backfired on us, as it should have. Um, but I don't know. On the other hand, if everybody's running together, it's definitely going to give more choices and more participation. So I feel really confused about it. I'm not sure. And I'm sure that whatever we do is going to have some unintended consequences. But I am positive, to quote Bill Clinton, if we keep doing what we're doing now and expect a different result, then we're insane. <laughs> <laughs>
And my answer is simple. I think, I think back when the party was funded, the money wasn't spent on negative campaigns. The money was spent on building infrastructure, yeah. on building uh, messaging out there. Uh, they always tried to help the candidates in terms of understanding what the messages need to be to the wider audience, not just the Republicans. Um, and one of the things we didn't mention about super PACs is that not only do they add to the negativism because they think their job is to do the negative, they also add to the negativism because when they're doing fundraising, they also are very yeah, negative. That's true too. And so they're, they're playing it at both ends, both to raise money and to get behind a certain candidate. And, um, you know, I think you could take George Soros's money, you could take the Koch brothers' money and put it directly into a campaign rather than into a super PAC. Then the question becomes, is it worth the trouble of taking that million dollars from the candidate? Then it becomes an issue for the candidate. Now it's hidden, and that needs to change. Yeah, you know, it's, it's ironic, because Selena, you and I talked about a piece I did for the Journal a couple of months ago about the weakness of the parties, and the irony is if you want less partisanship, you should have stronger parties. That's it right. It seems totally counterintuitive, <laughs> but that's the reality of what and we're And it's in. hard to make that argument to the public because it seems counterintuitive. Yeah, exactly. I will go here and then back there. Uh, thank you for coming and uh, giving us a very enlightening discussion. Uh, in your polling, has there been any result or any expression about term limits? Mm. Because uh, both uh, Biden and Mitch McConnell were at Lincoln's Gettysburg Address. <laughs> uh, and I, I just, I just, it just, you know, it's, it just seems ridiculous to have people who have long past their prime still in office. <laughs> well, I'm not going to touch that with a 10-foot pole, but <laughs> I will say this. I, well, I'm personally totally against term limits. I think we have term limits. You could vote them out. You could vote for a primary. Now, do I think it would be nice if both parties would have some more change in leadership and younger leadership coming up? Yeah, for real. Uh, and I don't know how we got in this situation. Um, and, um, but uh, I, I hear you. And I do think, I mean, we know from the data when younger people, and it's to your question, when younger people run, more younger people vote. And frankly, right now with the reduced participation, while it, it tends to take to ideological polls, the other thing that it's doing is it's both primary electorates are now older than Methuselah. If, you know, the, if the candidates were at the Gettysburg Address, well, the primary <laughs> voters were at the inauguration of George Washington. <laughs> uh, so, you know, we need to get more young people in this process. And until we run more younger candidates, I don't think we're going to get it to happen. Uh, AOC, who's our client, she mobilized a lot of people, first time voters. She mobilized a, you know, a lot of young people. And she uses social media to die. I mean, she just did it. It's whether you agree or disagree with her, I would really encourage you. She just did a direct uh, TikTok to her supporters, which are millions of people, ta talking through with them how she saw the Gaza. Israeli conflict, and it was a very, very honest, authentic kind of communication that young people really appreciate. Frankly, as an old person, I really appreciated it, and you don't see that very often. It wasn't a 30-second soundbite. It was a, an hour-long um, conversation. Hmm. Ed, term limits? Uh, thumbs uh, up, thumbs I, down. I think we've had enough work to see term, li term limits really don't work, yeah. um, mm -hmm. because you take people that are there long enough to get some influence to do something for their voters and then you're going to vote them out for no reason and it caused all kinds of problems the next step up on very good people there and all of a sudden you're creating conflict with someone that wants well, to move up. term limits produce less experienced legislators which empowers people who aren't elected staff members right. and lobbyists. Lobbyists and, and right. staffers, mm -hmm. yeah. Um, so I, I think the age thing is kind of overdone. Um, my favorite president was Ronald Reagan, and um, you know he was not quite as old as the current president. I think polarization is the bigger problem. Mm -hmm. um, 
You know, I was very favorable. I ran John McCain's convention um, in 2008. I was a great John McCain fan. He's one of the people that taught me civility, mm -hmm. quite frankly, and, mm -hmm. um, uh, and respect and why it should be there. I mean, we put in the back of the book both the letter to America that was read the day after he died and the eulogy by uh, Biden of him. And both are classic documents of true respect and civility, um, and that's why we wanted it to be in the book. Um, I like Biden. I thought Biden was centrist. My Republican friends who complain about Biden because he has gone, in their mind, way to the left with the progressives, uh, maybe that's Celinda's influence, but I say to them, we did a survey uh, 10 days after the mm -hmm. 20 election, and we asked a job approval of Biden. And 93% of Republicans strongly disapproved <laughs> of the job he was doing two and a half months before he took the job. <laughs> um, that's how polarized we are in this country. And I say to my Republican friends that if you were planning on him being a, more of a centrist, then you need to speak up with these Republicans that he got absolutely no uh, honeymoon with every Republican voter in this country. Yeah, that's great. Yeah. Uh, we'll go there and then over here. Uh, thank you both for being here. This has been so incredible. I am actually a current, con a current candidate for US Congress over in Kansas District 3. And I wanna ask you, as a candidate, one of the things that has been the weaving thread through tonight is voter engagement. Mm -hmm. What can we do to get more people to get out and engage and vote in our candidates? Good question. Mm -hmm. Really good question. I'm gonna answer a different way. Um, we decided um, to not go with a major publisher. We went with a hybrid because we knew when we want the book to come out right after the 22 election. Um, and uh, so we went with a hybrid that took our book and if the book met their standards, then they published it. So we didn't have a major publisher behind us. And yet we made the Wall Street Journal bestsellers list in three weeks. So it wasn't because we had a big publicist behind us or a big campaign behind us. It's because people are ready for niceness out there. And when they saw the subject matter, they grabbed it up. And I found that is very encouraging. And I find when I talk to groups and I talk about positive campaignings and talk about being for what you're for, not what you're against, um, it gets a great response out there. So I would say, how do you get voter engagement? is engage with them, don't tell them. Yeah, I think a couple of other things that are intriguing, um, and I'll go to um, AOC as an example of this. One of the things that she does um, to her list is periodically she will engage her list to do something not political. Uh, like when the power went off in Texas and so many people were suffering, she engaged her list to give to, um, to people whose power were out and to get them power and food and water. Now, the people that she got, myself included, firmly believe that Abbott was completely responsible for that situation. Pissed as hell at bailing him out. But that, you know, that's beside the point. There are people without food and water and electricity. And to be able to help those people is, is something really strong. Every fall, she enlists people, and it brings in younger people more, to do a, a backpack to school program where people come and stuff backpacks. And um, the donations for a particular period of time, all of the donations to her are, are, donate, are committed to the backpack, buying the stuff for the backpacks rather than her races. Um, so I think there are things you can do. The other thing is authenticity. Uh, besides the having a real message is authenticity. People are really hungry for authenticity. And unfortunately, our, kind of, our campaigns right now don't serve that very well. And I will tell you another story about AOC. Uh, when we were polling for her, and it's against a Democratic incumbent, so people were pissed as hell that we were doing this. And um, she was being accused of being the candidate for bartenders. 
and they did not mean it as a compliment. <laughs> and so I barrel in in my little night, and I said, you know, we got to answer this. They're saying you're the bartender for uh, you're the candidate for bartenders, and she turned to me and she said, Celinda. I am the candidate for bartenders. <laughs> I'm okay with that. And I said, oh, okay. And she said, I am a bartender. And she's a science award winner and brilliant. And it's like, oh, okay. All right, I guess we'll go with that. Could we round it out a little bit and say you won a science award too? But her clarity and authenticity is like, I'm cool with this. Uh, I want to represent bartenders and the waitresses and everybody else in the district. Um, and so authenticity matters a lot. Most people, I mean, grassroots has really dis disappeared from campaigns, and then, um, you know, right now, post-COVID, uh, the Republicans were better at keeping it than the Democrats, and we can have a long conversation about whether that was meritorious or not, but um, relational organizing is one of the most effective tools. Engaging people to talk to people they know is literally one of the most persuasive things you can do. Better than, uh, and it costs money to organize and reach people, but better than uh, $50,000 worth of paid advertising. Uh, so. I'll, I'll just take advantage of my prerogative here to throw in one oh, other thought, which is that the, the most encouraging people on this front to me are young people. Yeah. You know, I mean, they're less cynical, they're yeah. less ideological, and. Well, they're and more cynical, actually, but. But they're but they're willing to listen. <laughs> they're willing to engage. They need to engage, yeah. And the what my fear is that if they are turned off by this process and yeah. drift away, then we're all in then well, we're they're all already in turned off by the process, and so we're in trouble. Yeah. And it's interesting you mentioned that because we, we started off, I think one of the mm. better things we did in the book is we decided to write the first nine chapters about the problems. Um, before we even started yeah. the tenth chapter. We knew we wanted to put it on the youth. We had seen some survey work that we had done showing that there was a high trust level um, of the youth kind of being our answer in the future. What was interesting, first of all, on that was it was very heavily amongst young people and very heavy amongst seniors. What, the group that was upside down negative about the youth were millennials. Hmm. Um, but then we got to, we finished the nine chapters and we started doing our work on looking at young people. And we ran into a problem. And the problem was is that it could be college educated, only high school educated, didn't matter on race or gender, they all responded the same way. Is I will, res I will respect someone else if they respect me first. And that's not the way the world works. And so uh, that's where, I'll give you a jump ahead to our conclusion, but that's where we talked about um, we need leaders to service, um, to light the way, much like McC uh, McCain did for me, that we need leaders yeah. to service. And um, I think, unfortunately, one of the ones that I saw was a senator from Nebraska who decided to go teach in Florida or yeah. run a, a, a university in Florida. Yeah. He was one of the best people we had yeah. on either side of the aisle yeah. in terms of civility and really talking about yeah. the real stuff. Yeah. Yeah. So, well, uh, I'm sorry. Well, very quick question. We're really out of time, but uh, you, you're a loyalist. I got to let you give the last question here. So make it quick. <laughs> Okay, I'll try. Uh, thank you for the discussion, and my question is kind of existential. Uh, you describe the current situation of polarization kind of a temporary mistake, a temporary disease, which can be solved and returned to normal status quo of mutual respect. But looking at like world history and global events and even history of this country, isn't polarization, chaos, and conflict the normalcy and mutual respect the exception, which we had here for some time, mm -hmm. and now we return to normalcy? Mm -hmm. So is, are, we in, are we in normal or abnormal? Well, I, I think that's not a question. It's an incredible way to, it's an incredibly thought-provoking ending. I don't know. God help us if you're right. Um, <laughs> we have always been, you know, I, I, I believe in the exceptionalism of America. Let's make sure this is a place where we're in the exception. But right now, we're not. I think we're on the edge of a cliff, and it's a very dangerous cliff. Um, I don't think either side is right. right. Um, I think we need to find, um, you know, it's, it's, it's very interesting. We ask, um, I think I've convinced Celinda sometimes to do this. We, in our polling for 30 years, we don't ask, are you conservative, 
uh, liberal or moderate. Mm -hmm. uh, my belief is moderate has become, number one, a safe haven for many people in polls. If I'm a moderate, don't ask me any tough questions. <laughs> um, but they've also been demonized by the right and the left of not being interested, not caring, not paying attention. Um, and so I tend to not use the word moderate. I like the word centrist. Mm -hmm. And the way we do our surveys is we ask, are you conservative or liberal? And if you volunteer your moderate, we then write that down. Mm -hmm. But in 30 years of asking that question, moderate has never broken yeah. 10%, never. But then we ask, are you very conservative, very liberal, uh, very, conser very conservative, somewhat conservative, very liberal, somewhat conservative. What's interesting is if you take the somewhat conservative, somewhat liberal, and the moderates, the volunteer moderates, and put them as a centrist, it's 68% of the country. And they are the ones that are not saying, I need to fight over a thing. They're saying, why aren't we getting answers to our problems and our solutions? So I think part of getting not falling off that cliff is we have to get the, the, the center here to basically push the far right, the far left, sorry, Celinda, um, off to the side and say, no, we have a voice and this is what our voice says. We want solutions, we don't want fighting. That seems like a great ending point. Um, so uh, thank you, uh, and I want you all to join me in thanking you in a second, but if you do have the book, I think that Celinda and Ed can be persuaded to sign it for you and Absolutely. there's a table back there to do it. Um, this has been very thought-provoking, and thank you both for thank you. coming out, for joining us, and thank you all for you know joining in and yeah. great questions. So. Thank you. And thank you, Jerry, for great moderating. Right, thank you.